Hello, and welcome to Science Fiction University. In our last episode, we spoiled a 50-year-old, not nearly as good as Driftglass remembered it, movie about an android called Questor that laid the foundation for one of the most successful and beloved characters in Star Trek. That movie, The Questor Tapes, is available on DVD from Amazon. We do not recommend you buy it. No, no. But maybe we'll give our copy away (laughs) as a prize. (laughs) You know, we haven't figured out the contest yet, though, so stand by for that. We're your writer and fan hosts. I'm Blue Gal. And I'm Drift Glass. And you can visit Science Fiction University at our website, sciencefictionuniversity.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast, and you really should. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution to Science Fiction University, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And since this podcast is in fact called Science Fiction University, in this episode, we're going to take a step back and talk about the ways science fiction distinguishes itself from other genres and ways it doesn't. So to do the thing that has started more fistfights in more convention suites than any other subject, we will now define for all time, with no discussion or debate, (laughs) the different genres under the umbrella of the term speculative fiction. And if you don't agree with these definitions, then you're stupid. And and wrong. According to the con suite. That's right. You're out. No chocolate for you. No chocolate (laughs) and cheap beer for you. Oh my gosh! Um, unless you're the one of the three women up there, in which case, you know what? You you, you got to get a point. whatever you want. Sure. Can I bring you more cheap beer? <laughs> um, now, we do this in the knowledge that some people use the term speculative literature and the term science fiction interchangeably. That's fine. You know, the magazine I once edited it was titled Speculit, and it was nothing but very polished and very published science fiction stories that my friend. Uh, the late Phyllis Eisenstein, still had on her file from years of teaching science fiction at Columbia College. Fun fact, she also taught fantasy. She also wrote science fiction and wrote fantasy. But for the purposes of this lesson today, we're borrowing this definition of speculative fiction from Lisa Wood, who is an instructor at SNHU who writes horror under the name of L. Marie Wood. Quote, General fiction is character-driven. These characters are often dealing with real-life situations. Speculative fiction lives in the space where real life and make-believe converge, allowing for the interplanetary travel, time travel, and the undead to come out and play, unquote. Now, borrowing from the book reviewing platform Goodreads, we're going to spend a minute on the various types of speculative fiction. And yes, we're very aware that these categories often overlap. (laughs) Yes, they do. So no fighting in the con suite. Right. Uh, First, there is alternate history. Most alternate history is based more or less on actual events and imagines a world where things have gone differently. In this genre, there is Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee, Alt History of the Civil War, and Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. Yay! And as a science fiction aficionado... No doubt you've noticed how certain time travel stories can overlap with alternate history. For example, Ray Bradbury's story, A Sound of Thunder, where a time-traveling big game hunter accidentally steps off the path and kills a bug and changes human history. Now, you might be familiar with that only through the Simpsons episode, but that still counts. That as counts. Simpsons history. counts. Mm-hmm. There's also Isaac Asimov's hard-to-find novel, The End of Eternity, about a temporal orthodoxy enforcement bureau, which is constantly tweaking history to achieve certain outcomes. We talked about this in our Destroy the Timeline, Defend the Timeline, Episode 8, which included Loki, Travelers, The City on the Edge of Forever, Star Trek Episode, and 112263. Now, the next category is fantasy fiction, which is broadly understood to involve magic and does not incorporate scientific advancements or technology. Examples might include The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum, the Harry Potter series by J.K. Rowling, and the Lord of the Rings trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien. There are swords and heroes to swing them. There are quests to go on. There are magical villains to be overcome and princesses to be saved. Which is why the original Star Wars trilogy is not, not, not science fiction. Go ahead, come at me, hate me all you want. It ain't science fiction. It is fantasy with lightsabers instead of swords, 
and Jedi and Sith instead of wizards, and the Force instead of magic. But it's still fantasy. But it does lead us to the main subject of this episode, Robert Heinlein's 1963 novel, Glory Road. We'll also touch on the techno mages of Babylon 5. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about John Varley's Wizard Demon trilogy and Anne McCaffrey's The Dragon Riders of Pern trilogy. Actually, no, it's a 24 series uh, of novels. And of course, Arthur Clarke's Law. In fact, let's do Clarke's Law right now, which is actually Clarke's third law. But today we don't really care about the first two. So let's just focus on the third, which is, and I quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, unquote. So saith Arthur C. Clarke, this is beyond debate. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is where genre overlap gets fun and kind of interesting and entertaining. For example, the 1980 movie Somewhere in Time, which my mom loved, starring Christopher Reeve and written by the very prolific Richard Matheson, is about time travel. But there is no technology involved. Just a place, a real place, the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island in Michigan, and a mindset. These are sufficient to send him back from the present day to 1912. It's definitely time travel, but absent any science, is this science fiction? Or is it fantasy? Or is it something else entirely? Uh, we looked it up, and IMDb classifies it as time travel slash romance. Now, consider that horror novels can have supernatural or magical elements, so it combines a couple of things. And a zombie apocalypse might well be caused by scientists screwing around with things they never should have touched. So for the working writer, genres can be quite porous, more like, you know, suggestions than really rigid codes of conduct. A friend of mine who is a professional writer once told me that the most practical way to judge whether or not something was science fiction or fantasy or whatever was which category the publisher who pays you slots it into. <laughs> Which I got to agree. <laughs> Wherever the money is, is where you're going to name your book. <laughs> Absolutely. And and conversely, this is why writers like Harlan Ellison and Kurt Vonnegut did not want to be categorized. Mm -hmm. Because they viewed genre as kind of a, a, a literary ghetto. If you could be classed as literature, then you can go up with Moby Dick. And you can go up with um, um, Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. But if you're, if you're in one of these genres, then you're stuck with whatever the genre uh, is defined as. Uh, also, it depends on which shelf your book appears on. So mm -hmm. if, you're, if your book appears on the science fiction part of Barnes & Noble, then it must be science fiction. If it's fantasy, it must be fantasy, and so forth. The next genre is horror fiction, which refers to fiction meant to scare, unsettle, or horrify the audience, according to Goodreads' definition. It often deals with gruesome or frightening themes and its content. Horror can also contain fantastical creatures like vampires or werewolves, but the tone and intent to frighten sets horror apart from other speculative subgenres. Examples of horror, of course, include Dracula by Bram Stoker and The Shining by Stephen King. And a lot of other things by Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then there is post-apocalyptic dystopian fiction, which is currently extremely popular, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Yeah. These stories are set in a world in which humankind has been devastated and often nearly extinct. These worlds, sometimes set on Earth, frequently have limited technology and focus on how the remnants of humanity try to survive after some catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. uh, examples include A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, and The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, and of course... Of course. Of course, Handmaid's Tale is it, by is, Margaret Atwood. Is Handmaid's Tale even fiction anymore, Blue Gown? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, it, every day, every mm -hmm. day. Uh, and actually, you know, Margaret Atwood famously uh, put actual events throughout Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. She researched this book, and everything that she... She says everything that happened in that book has happened somewhere in the world. Yeah, well, it, and that's uh, that, that's a good writer's 80s. point. That's yeah. a good point. For, the telling very specific details mm -hmm. um, is mm -hmm. what makes a story come alive. But what Station Eleven had going for it was how incredibly specific it was about the people, the places, mm -hmm. and the events, and and knowledge down to the fingertips of what it felt like in Chicago, what it feels like all around Lake Michigan, mm -hmm. what what these mm -hmm. objects that were lost to history and were being kept in a museum feel like and and were used for. So you writers out there, remember. The really specific detail is actually what sells your story for you. So sorry right. to interrupt. No, that's okay. 
These post-apocalyptic narratives may be described as dystopian fiction, but dystopian fiction can also more broadly refer to narratives about a society undergoing a great and imagined injustice, as in George Orwell's 1984. I would also say Fahrenheit 451 falls into the, that category as well. I, I huh? and really it does it does matter uh, because apocalyptic is one thing; it's the end of history. You know, it's mm-hmm. the destruction of all things. And dystopian means things might be going really great, but it's a tyranny. You know, right. it's it's a right. te- because without all the technology in Fahrenheit 451, they couldn't burn all those books. Right. Right. And then there's the genre after which we named this podcast: science mm-hmm. fiction. Stories which rely on current or imagined technological advances and the exploration of the consequences of those developments. Uh Uh, We don't need to come up with examples, but here are some examples anyway. (laughs) Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. The Martian by Andy Weir. 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, the the great question in science fiction is always what if Mm -hmm. or if this goes on. It's always a matter of projection and prediction. Um, the best example I know of genre fying a story is a story that comes from the sit down that Phyllis Eisenstein, my late friend, had with George R.R. R. Martin in 1991 when he showed her the very first few chapters of a novel he was working on set in an imaginary world, but it had no science fiction in it. There was no magic, no fantastic elements at all. And he was struggling to figure out what to do with the story. And she knew that George admired fantasy writers like Tolkien, and she urged him to, quote, put the dragons in, George, unquote, and turn it into an epic fantasy. And Martin did as she suggested, and the result was the novel A Game of Thrones. Now, Martin acknowledged Eisenstein's contribution to his work by dedicating the third volume of the series, A Storm of Swords, to her. It was for Phyllis who told me to add dragons, something to that effect. Whenever I'm in a bookstore... Yeah. And someone's with me. I go, this This was a friend of mine. And she really did change the course of literary history. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because, I mean, she used to say, look, I'm a better writer than George. Okay. <laughs> I'm a better, I plot better. I'm more, more sort of precise in how I do things. But I'm sitting on the L. I'm reading his stuff. And I go past my stop. Yeah. Because it's so engrossing. It draws you in. He's such a compellingly um, um, readable guy. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know how he does that. I don't know. I don't know what trickery he's using, but he's he's just so absorbing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. she really did just say, "Look, you got all the elements here for a fantasy novel. Why aren't you putting dragons into it?" Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. And and he also did have an outline. She was always like, "Well, show me your outline." And he was like, "I don't. I don't have." No, one. I just keep writing about got, the queen, and that's it. Yeah, I got three hundred pages, and I don't have an outline. It's like George. And he really George was George. telling a royal story of a royal family with various fighting elements to it Mm -hmm. but no dragons yeah and 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 this shows that adding in or taking out various story elements can move a story from one genre to another Mm -hmm. or as is often the case these days writers feel free much freer than they used to i think to use all genres as kind of a palette that they can use to tell the stories they want to tell i mean i defy anyone to tell me what genre magic realism except it's magic realism yeah so yeah and that's great. That's a wonderful development for writers who want to be really creative and not feel hidebound by a specific category. Speaking of dragons, Drift Glass, Anne yeah. McCaffrey's Dragon Rider series has dragons right in the title. Yeah, it's right there. This is that massive series comprising 22 novels and two collections of short stories. A wor- Is it a work of fantasy, Drift Glass? Or not. Or is it not? On the one hand, McCaffrey became the first woman to win a Hugo Award for Dragonflight the first book in that 22-novel series, as well as the first woman to win a Nebula Award. And the Hugo and the Nebula are definitely science fiction awards. So, subject closed, matter is settled. The end. The end. (laughs) On the other hand, in August 1987, Locus, the magazine of science fiction and fantasy field, ranked two of the eight Dragon Pern novels among the all-time best fantasy novels. Oh. Based on a poll of subscribers, Dragon Flight was ninth and White Dragon 23rd. Mm-hmm. But on the other, other hand, Drift Glass, McCaffrey herself considered most of her work science fiction and enjoyed, quote, cutting them short when they call me a fantasy writer. <laughs> I'm not a fantasy writer. Unquote. I'm a science fiction writer. <laughs> oh, and, and a fun fact, I think White Dragon 
uh, was the first science fiction story, one of the first to make the New York Times bestseller list. Ah. So, yeah. It's a great writer. So here's a plot summary from Wikipedia of Dragonflight. Is this Dragonflight? The, the introduction. This is sort of the... This oh, is the okay. The plot summary to, to the books. Yeah. Okay. To the series. Mm-hmm. Humans have colonized the planet Pern in the Ruckbat star system, but have lost much of their technology and history, including their origin on Earth, due to periodic onslaughts of thread, a spore that voraciously consumes all organic material, including humans and their crops, given the opportunity. Thread comes from the Red Star, actually another planet. Thread rains down on Pern at predictable intervals. The Pernies use intelligent, fire-breathing dragons to fight Thread. A human rider has a telepathic bond with their dragon, formed by impression at the dragon's hatching. The bonding instantly creates a very close, lifelong relationship. The dragon almost invariably commits suicide at the rider's death, and a rider whose dragon died bears a deep emotional wound, which can never be fully healed. Later books deal with the initial colonization of Pern and the genetic modification of small native animals into creatures capable of carrying humans in flight. So. Science fiction? Science fiction, colonization, genetic manipulation, uh, organic chemistry. The technology is lost, but we still have a society and so on and so forth. So this is not a fantasy series, but it uses fantasy elements to tell a science fiction story. Now, here's a clip from J. Michael Straczynski doing something very similar, deliberately blending magic and technology to create his techno-mages in the Babylon 5 TV series. Captain, do you believe there is such a thing as magic? Well, when I was 12, I used to sit in my dad's garden, the air full of the smell of orange blossoms, watching the sky dreaming of faraway places. Back then, I think I believed in just about everything. But now, I don't know. I do think there are some things we don't understand. If we went back in time a thousand years and tried to explain this place to people, they could only accept it in terms of magic. So perhaps it is magic. The magic of the human heart. Focus made manifest by technology. Every day you here create greater miracles than the burning bush. Maybe. But God was there first and he didn't need solar batteries and a fusion reactor to do it. Perhaps, perhaps not. It is within that ambiguity that my brothers and I exist. We are dreamers, shapers, singers, and makers. We study the mysteries of laser and circuit, crystal and scanner, holographic demons and invocations of equations. These are the tools we employ, and we know many things, such as the true secrets, the important things, 14 words to make someone fall in love with you forever, seven words to make them go without pain, how to say goodbye to a friend who is dying, how to be poor, how to be rich, how to rediscover dreams when the world has stolen them from you. That is why we are going away, to preserve that knowledge. Which brings us to Robert Heinlein's 1963 novel, Glory Road. Uh, by 1963, Heinlein had published his most famous novel, A Stranger in a Strange Land, and had picked up the third of eventual four Hugo Awards that he was going to win, and he was cranking out what seemed like half the monthly content of John Campbell's astounding science fiction magazine under his own name and two pseudonyms. So busy, busy, busy writer cranking out science fiction. So what next? He's conquered all the worlds. He's won all the awards. What do you do next? And he decided to try a fantasy novel. Now, the novel was Glory Road, which was also nominated for a Hugo Award, but lost out to Clifford Simak's Way Station. Now, Glory Road first appeared as a serial in the July through September 1963 issues of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and was released hardcover later that year. And right there in the title is the separation of the genres, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, two separate creatures that coexist um, uncomfortably in the con suite. 
This was also before Robert Heinlein's right-wing libertarian tone began intruding on his work to the point of being really obnoxious. You can say that again. (laughs) Yeah, it it really gets under your skin after a while. I mean, he's still a good storyteller, but Jesus. Uh, uh, It was in a tone that one reviewer noted, quote, that most people seemingly cannot describe without using the word hectoring, unquote, which I completely agree with. Instead, the protagonist in Glory Road grumbled about the state of the world in what British science fiction critic David Pringle has called a, quote, grouchy but amusing octorial tone, unquote. Heinlein's complaints about the world are presented with a lighter and more humorous touch, which gives the novel kind of a fun, page-turning quality. We enjoyed listening to it. As to the plot, it feels almost like Heinlein, being an engineer by training, took out a sheet of paper and drew a line right down the middle and made two columns and put all the hard fantasy elements on one side. That's the 20 different universes in this story and fire-breathing dragons and various monsters, including an ogre and giant rats and magic and spells and so on and so on. Put all of those in one column and on the opposite side of the page, put various rational pseudoscientific explanations for why this wasn't all just hocus pocus or why our protagonists ignorant, try it again, or why our protagonists ignorance of the wider universe made it seem like magic. You remember from the Terminator, uh, our, our protagonist saying, I don't know tech stuff. You know, you can dismiss a lot of things that seem like magic because you're just not trained to understand it. So once again, we find Arthur Clarke's third law in operation. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, unquote. The result is a pleasing novel that most readers see as a dividing line between gripping storytelling Heinlein and cranky libertarian Heinlein. Before proceeding, we should probably introduce the main characters of the novel. (laughs) Yeah, we should. Evelyn Cyril Gordon, which is such a feminine name for such a butch character. Uh uh, He would much rather you call him EC or Easy or Oscar. Uh, He is the narrator of the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Star, the Empress of the 20 Universes, and Rufo. Rufo is Star's grandson, but he's also an old man. And her status as empress and his status as her grandson is not revealed till near the last third of the novel. This this podcast has spoilers in it, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the audiobook of Glory Road, by the way, is narrated by Bronson Pinchot, who does an amazing job. He personifies old men and hot women, in addition to those libertarian heroes. Uh, The novel is told in the first person by Gordon, who was in his early 20s. After being nearly killed by a wound from a bolo during the early phases of what appears to be the Vietnam War, Gordon is discharged and decides to spend some time in Europe before returning to college in the States. This is white guy 1960. Yeah, really. He can can go anywhere. He can take a month off, whatever he, he wants to do. He'll figure something out. Yeah. On a nudist beach... On the Ile du Levant, that's by the French Riviera, he spots a beautiful naked blonde woman to whom he speaks briefly. The next day in Nice, Gordon reads the following ad in the Herald Tribune. Are you a coward? This is not for you. We badly need a brave man. He must be 23 to 25 years old, in perfect health, at least six feet tall, weigh about 190 pounds, fluent English with some French, proficient in all weapons, Some knowledge of engineering and mathematics essential, willing to travel, no family or emotional ties, indomitably courageous and handsome of face and figure. (laughs) Permanent employment, very high pay, glorious adventure, great danger. You must apply in person, Rue Dante Nice, Deuxième Etage, Apartment D. Oscar discovers that the ad has been placed by that very gorgeous naked blonde lady. Woo-hoo! Whose name is Star. Yes, it's Star. And she pretty much placed that ad after she met him. Yeah. Well, and we <laughs> find out later that she has been looking for someone like him for a long time. Right. For years and years and years. And without too much more foreplay, uh, Star and Oscar and Rufo are whisked away to another world in another universe as they begin their dangerous quest on the glory road. The glory road. And the thing about Glory Road as a novel is that it ends several chapters after what would be the traditional end of the quest. What happens after the hero gets the golden MacGuffin? The hero completes his quest and they live happily ever after. Nope. It turns out 
administering the 20 galaxies is a full-time job. And Star, the queen of these galaxies, is very similar in my mind to another Heinlein character, Lazarus Long. She has uh, the perspective of having lived hundreds of years. And in her head, she has the persona of dozens of previous emperors. This makes her incredibly pragmatic, ruthlessly pragmatic. She has a job to do. She needs to recover this thing. Oscar, Scar, her beloved, is a means to that end, and she manipulates him every inch of the way to get the job done. Doesn't mean she doesn't love him, doesn't mean she doesn't care, but she's been around long enough to have a grandson who's now an old man. So she has this incredibly alien perspective on the world that everyone else doesn't have. And this book has the feel for me as a female reader of scenes from a marriage in terms of the excitement of meeting someone, falling in love, having an adventure, getting married, and then the ordinary sets in. She's He is married to the queen of the galaxy. Right. 20 and, universes. She's in charge of 20 universes, for goodness yeah. sake. And, yeah. and Oscar needs a job. He's first husband. Mm-hmm. And he hates it. It's boring for the war hero adventurer. He needs a hobby, and a hobby isn't enough. He's somebody who wants to go and fight dragons or demons or whatever and have quests. And here he is, a house husband. And again, extending the story past the denouement has consequences for the reader. Life does go on. And that, to me, is the interesting part of the story. Yeah. In the first part of the book, all of his problems are monetary. He never has enough money to get what he wants. He wants to go back to college. He can't afford it. It's all about the GI Bill, pass, but not for the war you're in, so there's not enough money for you. And he's just scraping by for pennies. And he's in, he's living on a beach, finding the cheapest way to live possible. And by the, the, the last third of the novel, he has bowls of jewels. He has homes being built for him to amuse him because he wants to fish for trout. And so we'll blow out a building and we'll put it in a trout stream for you. He is the house husband. He is the mm-hmm. courtesan. And he can have anything he wants. But what he wants is something to engage himself productively. And he finds that he's not good at anything. Everyone else in the universe is better at everything than he is. And all he knows how to do is slay dragons and go on adventures, which he's very good at. And one thing that sets this apart from young adult fiction now, for example, young adult fiction being written like Harry Potter or the Hunger Games or whatever, is this is not the story of a 14-year-old or 15-year-old or 16-year-old uh, g- uh, coming of age uh, and, and finding out they're the chosen one and going on a special quest. This is about a 23-year-old guy who is horny, who likes to have sex a lot. And there is a lot of sex going on in this 1963 story. Everybody is sleeping with everybody in this story. Uh, in fact, our hero almost screws up their quest because... He didn't recognize that the custom of hospitality to a hero in the first world they visit is to sleep with and hopefully impregnate the host's wife and whichever other household members he can handle. He thinks turning down all these lovely ladies is the noble thing to do. And it isn't. It is a mortal insult that nearly costs them their lives. So after that's straightened out, everybody sleeps with everybody. They spend three days there. They leave drunk and happy. But everybody's fucking all Mm -hmm. the time. Um, Now, one of the reasons I wanted to do this novel, well, there's two reasons, actually. One, it's a fun novel, and you and I listened to it together. Number two, the first time it was ever published in print was in July of 1963. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Which is a date that is near and dear to me, to my star, (laughs) to my queen of the 20 universes, uh, because that is the, the month that my wife was born. You didn't so, rehearse this part of the show. No, I did not. I kept it all to myself. I was a sneaky bastard. I kept it all to myself. <laughs> um, and I want everyone to know that my wife's birthday is coming up. Um, and this it's novel. It's a big one. It's, it's a big it's one. The it's yeah. the 6-0. It's the 6-0. And we will definitely be letting you know how you can support her and all the good work she does repeatedly, almost perhaps to the point of incessantly, almost to the Heinleinian point of being hectoring and obnoxious. <laughs> In future episodes. But for now, I just wanted to mention that part of the reason this story is terrific to me is it was published the month my wife was born. So thank you, Driftglass. Did you want to talk about John Varley's Wizard Demon trilogy a little bit? Just a little bit. I I read it a long, long time ago. And the Wizard Demon um, Titan, I think, is the third book in the trilogy. 
And John Varley is one of those writers who was really big in the 70s and 80s. And he hasn't, he didn't go away, but he just sort of faded out. But it was about a moon of Jupiter, I believe. I, I'm going to get some of the details wrong. That is actually sentient and is a uh, disc. So you can't see it very well. It's, it's only visible every now and then and disappears every now and then, but it's in our solar system and it is intelligent and it is aware and it is insane and it is old and it has given birth to other little children that are going on their merry way. And it's the story of this insane deity that lives in our solar system, granting wishes to human beings and making things appear out of thin air and, and keeping, um, just inventing life forms out of thin air. And inviting various humans up to pass various tests and have their wishes granted. But it is this sort of mixture of what if an, an insane and sometimes really vengeful God really did exist. But it wasn't uh, God living in heaven. It was a God who was, a, who was a orbiting a planet in our solar system and had the power to grant pretty much any wish you could imagine. If you can get there and if the wish is doable, it will do it. Um, for fun. Uh, the God of this world keeps copies of all major cathedrals up in a, like an attic, full size, <laughs> like their pieces in a Monopoly board. Um, she has conjured out of thin air a combination of Michael Jackson and Fred Astaire, who's constantly dancing for her amusement. It's, and she has conjured air sharks that live up in the spokes of the wheel <laughs> and, and they attack by dropping off and accelerating to the point where they can open their mouths and ignite ramjets in their system so they can hit you at like 400 miles an hour and kill mm -hmm. you. It's a treacherous, dangerous, insane world, all governed by scientific principles. So it's a mad god living far away that can grant wishes or not, if you can get there or not. And our protagonists are people who come to them and have their, themselves cured or not. But it is hard science. But it has so many fantasy elements, so many of the elements you find in fantasy fiction that you can tell that right around this time, people did start mixing and matching. Yeah. You know, the, the walls and the con suite started to come down. You know what? Fantasy elements are just made up stuff happening in a magical world. Science fiction stories are just made up stuff happening in a science world. And Arthur Clarke comes along and says, you know what? If the technology is advanced enough, who cares if it's magic? Mm -hmm. Who cares mm -hmm. if it's science? If the story is good, the story is good. And that's where I think a lot of the most creative stuff comes from, that cross-genre stuff. And this was Heinlein's effort to do that. Um, the plot is good. It's, you know, typical quest story. Um, it's I think it, we, we listened to it in the car yeah. doing some trips and and got through it. And, and it's very entertaining. You just kind of listen along and there's a lot happening. And the yep. characters are fun. Yeah. And yeah, I think for an adult listener, you know, there's just enough sex to keep it spicy. Yeah, it's spicy. He likes to, she, he's always starting to spank her and she, she's always daring him to do so. So, you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, all right. They're an adult relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and, that's and what happens. Is, yeah. And she is so much more of an adult than he is. Yeah. Um, the, the part well, she's been alive for centuries. So. Yes. Yes. And. Every time she, and by the way, the MacGuffin in this story is this object, science object that contains the collective experiences of all previous emperors. The way that the galaxies are held together, the universes are held together is by the moral authority of the wisdom of the collection of emperors. And the problem has always been, well, when a good emperor dies, what happens to their experience? Well, it just goes away. Mm -hmm. So, so millennia ago, the scientists in this world found a way to basically download that person's experiences, all of them, the good and the bad and the horrible and the obnoxious, all of them into a matrix, into a, into a storage unit and put that in the head of the next person. Right. And that person then had, it took him a while. It took him a while to adapt to having the two voices in their head. Eventually the personality, you know, the dominant personality wins, but this has now gone on for centuries and the life of an emperor is not long. Um, yeah. it's, it's, they get assassinated often because people don't like this, you know, don't like this amount of power. But the idea is you're downloading, a, you're accumulating over the centuries, dozens and dozens of people's lives and putting them in your head. And every time Star downloads a new personality, she is different for a while. Yeah. And it's kind of like menopause. It really is. And, <laughs> and sometimes she's like Randy as hell. Sometimes mm -hmm. she's vicious. 
et cetera. But her, the, the thing that sets her apart from her lover and her husband, and they clearly love each other, is that she knows eventually he's going to go away mm-hmm. or she'll outlive him. And she's not broken up about that because no. she'd been through it enough times. Uh huh. And I guess the thing I want to say, we've done just so much spoiling for this book, but we can't spoil Bronson Pinchot's no. performance. No, it's, it's really good. It's just very, very good. It's, it's really good. good. He's a lot of fun to listen to. And it's not balky. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, he's really, he's, I don't know why he's out there taking food out of Alan Tudyk's mouth. I don't know <laughs> how, how this thing works, but okay, good on him. He, it's yeah. very good. He does a lot of science fiction audiobooks, and he's yeah. very good at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, we had a wonderful time doing this, and I had a wonderful time talking to my wife on Zoom about this wonderful novel. And I love her to death, and she is my queen of the 250 <laughs> universes. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. Science Fiction University is a project of DGBG Productions. You can support the show by donating via Patreon or PayPal at paypal.me slash proleftpodcast. There's more details at our website, sciencefictionuniversity.com.